Hi everybody, welcome back to RSA 2024. You're watching theCUBE's continuous cover. We are deep into day two. Come on inside of theCUBE. We got Nick Schneider here, he's the president and CEO of Arctic Wolf. Great to see you, Nick, face to face instead of yeah. over Zoom. Great to be here. Awesome to have you on. So, uh, good show. I mean, it's back to, yeah. to pre-COVID levels, isn't it? Yeah, it's packed. A lot of people, a lot of customers, partners, vendors ecosystem, so it's, it's, it's back to what it was. How do you spend your time at these shows? Just talking to customers after customer after customer? Yeah, a lot of customers, prospects, partners, you know, the ecosystem within security, obviously investors, um, so it's, it's kind of a mix across the board. When people ask me, like tonight, they'll say, who'd you talk to today? And I'll forget, I'll have to pull up my schedule, but, yeah. but it's so sometimes in the moment, it's like, hmm. But if you have to zoom out, what are some of the patterns and trends that you're hearing from those conversations? Yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of conversation about AI, a lot of conversation around platformization and kind of the convergence of several different markets within cybersecurity. Obviously there's conversation around, you know, how particular companies are doing in the marketplace, how IPO window is or isn't performing, um, and, you know, upcoming trends for, you know, to look out for as both a customer but also, you know, on the investment side. So when you say platformization, I mean, we know that on average, you know, customers have 50, 60, 75 tools installed, a lot of point products. When you say platformization, are you talking about, is it a consolidation or is it more a different mindset to, to have a platform that does more than just what a single point tool can do? Please explain that. Yeah, so I think you know, cybersecurity has evolved with a bunch of new threats, new attack surfaces, change in the way in which you know, bad actors are leveraging uh, those potential avenues to sure. attack. And uh, as a result of that, there's been a, you know, a, a myriad of different products that have been developed within the marketplace that have frankly have been left up to the customer to manage and make use of. And you even have some you know, vendors that have bought you know, or, or built different solutions for those different you know, siloed markets, if you will. And I think more and more you're seeing customers look to want to have a vendor that can help them to you know, solve for multiple attack surfaces or multiple outcomes within their security operation on a centralized platform and do it in a you know, sophisticated manner. So not feel like you know, I'm buying multiple solutions from a specific vendor, but I'm still managing them all individually. I might as well have just bought them from 10 different vendors. So I think you're seeing a lot of um, some of the larger players in particular in the cyber ecosystem look to provide multiple outcomes to their customer, but also do it on a platform in a way uh, that delivers that outcome and delivers that experience to the customer in kind of a unified way. But that would imply, or maybe I'm, I'm inferring that that should have an outcome of fewer tools, um, maybe fewer vendors to manage. Is that, you agree with that? Yeah, I okay. think that's, I think that's so, what customers are looking for. When you hear the narrative um, in the industry, you know, we always try to say, okay, here's what the vendor says, what's actually happening in the business. So you would think consolidation, not from an M&A standpoint, but from a tool standpoint, is happening. And so we did a survey with our ETR partner, mm -hmm. I was telling you about it beforehand. Prior to the show, it was 321 people. I'll show you the results. Yeah. And the question we asked is, over the next 12 months, you know, which of the following best describes how you're going to uh, approach you know, the number of vendors in your stack? I was, I mean, I, I'm not surprised that it was increased 50%, sorry, you can't see this, 50% said we're going to increase. Only 9% said we're going to decrease the number of vendors. Yep. And of those, only 6% said we're going to do, do so through consolidation. I'm sure it doesn't surprise you. It doesn't surprise any practitioner yeah. I've shown this to. So we asked them why. Why aren't, you, why aren't you able to decrease the number of vendors? And you kind of touched on this, and I want to get your reaction. They said, we need um, new innovation to fill the gaps, number one. And two, we have to have best of breed and we can't get that from what you kind of alluded to before, I'm buying a bunch of tools from one yeah. throat to choke. Yep. That's nice, maybe from a procurement standpoint, but it doesn't solve my problem. So yeah. how do you respond to that? Yeah, so I think it'll be an evolution. So mm -hmm. I think more and more customers that I talk to are looking for vendors that will allow them to achieve multiple outcomes on top of a centralized platform, but they're also not looking to do that overnight. So what they're looking for is a platform that is relatively open, that can make use of and, and take advantage of the investments they've already made in specific you know, products or products that they intend to bring in, but also kind of future-proof them with regards to kind of the foundation of their overall security operation. 
right. you know, we've, we've tried hard as a business to make sure that we continue to innovate on individual attack surfaces or new threats within the marketplace, outcomes for the customer, but also remain open and agnostic to customer choice so that as they kind of work through this security journey, if you will, that they can make the determination for themselves and we can kind of help them in that journey over time. Uh, and I think the vendors that do it right will be able to help their customers consolidate to a number of vendors that make sense, but also allow them the choice to use a best of breed product maybe on a specific use case within cyber, but not feel like they have to do all or nothing or feel like they have to be kind of left to do it all themselves. Explain that a little further for the audience. So you've got, you can, you're providing a managed service, so you're taking away a lot of the heavy lifting. Underneath the covers, you've got best of breed technologies that your, your engineering team you know, chooses, vets, and, and curates, yeah. essentially, and then provide that to the market. Am I getting that right? Yeah, so we built a, a platform that's multi-tenant uh, and it operates across all the attack surfaces uh, as well as all the outcomes that we deliver as a business. So we have detection and response against all the threat attack surfaces. We have vulnerability management, awareness training, incident response capabilities, uh, insurance, you know, risk transfer you know, products and capabilities. And the beauty of that is that platform operates at massive, massive scale. So it's ingesting now over five trillion observations a week. Uh, and it's presenting back to the customer really one you know, actionable event or alert per day. So a huge number uh, of incidents or, or, or observations down to a, a very manageable number of you know, events that a customer has to manage per day. And then we augment that with some level of human intelligence as well. So you know, think one per day is an event that the customer might be working through through the platform itself, but there might be one per week that the customer says, hey, this is a new application for me, or the remediation steps aren't completely clear, or I'm not familiar with what I need to do on this, and that's where they get to engage with our concierge team, and it's kind of this marriage of robust platform, open agnostic to the technologies that are using, but also quite a bit of native technology, married with this concierge approach, which helps them to make sure that they're achieving the outcome that they set out to deliver from the beginning. And in that scenario, that particular example you just gave, you're essentially augmenting the SecOps team that's in-house, because when I first met you, um, I was under the impression, and I think you started down market, yeah. and you have moved up market, and I remember, I think we talked about it, I'm like, really, you're going up market? You're like, yeah, we are. And yeah. I remember I would see you guys at shows, and I would ask your sales guys, you guys, how's it going up market? Oh, it's actually good, we got traction. So I'm yeah. like, okay, it's actually happening. So, two questions here. One is, kind of affirm that. The second is, if I'm a smaller business, I might not have a SecOps team. Yep. You, 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 you're not that SecOps team, but a, an IT partner would be, right? You got a network of partners that would do that, is that correct? That's right, so, uh, so certainly yes, we're seeing a lot of traction up market. I think that's mm -hmm. a result of two things. One, we've brought to market a lot more capabilities than we had three, four, five years ago. Those capabilities are interesting to a more sophisticated, sophisticated customer. And then secondly, I think the market's changed a little bit. I think you're having larger and larger organizations say, hey, this has gotten a little out of control. Like, why am I trying to be a security company and a healthcare company or a manufacturer? And they're looking for a vendor to help kind of augment or, or own the foundation of their security operation. And then as it relates to like the way in which the customer you know, interacts with the platform, uh, it's all about uh, the manner in which they want to interact with the platform itself. So a smaller SMB account might have a lot more heavy interaction with both the platform, but then also ask a few additional questions of the security practitioner on our team or the concierge team, whereas a larger, more sophisticated customer might be more geared towards the platform work and the data in the, in the platform itself versus the human interaction. So, so we feather the engagement with the customer kind of in and out depending on their need, um, but the platform itself helps to present that data in a way that is easily digestible. So, the original premise of your business, at least I thought, was I loved it because smaller companies, small and mid-sized companies, they don't have a security team. Yeah. It probably over half of the companies don't, and I said, yep. all right, great. Call a company who's experts, this is what you do. Love it. Did you always know, you always have a plan to go up market, or was this part of a, a, a TAM expansion? Um, let me start there, and I have some other follow-up questions on that. Um, I think we set out to solve a problem for an, uh, a segment of the market that was frankly materially underserved. Right, so right. we knew that there was a wide swath of the market that couldn't find the talent, and even if they could find the talent, it's hard to retain the talent, and even if they can retain the talent, their budget isn't where it needs to be to be able to do everything that was required of a security operation, and that problem's only gotten worse. Everything's gotten more sophisticated, more complex, and the talent shortage hasn't gotten any better. Uh, I think the upmarket move 
uh, was a product of the change in the market and the change of our, of our capability. So uh, the change in the market, I think, was more noted, right? So we had more and more customers year over year saying, hey, I know we talked to you last year and we were saying we we're going to try to do this ourselves. How about maybe not? <laughs> uh, so let's talk about how you could feather into what we do and maybe help to augment, maybe help over time to kind of be the cornerstone of what we do. Uh, and that has changed materially as kind of the complexity of the landscape has changed. So sort of CEO philosophy here. So you had clearly had product market fit down market. Yep. Different dynamic up market. Yep. You're now sort of partnering there's kind of this, I guess, shared responsibility yep. model. Um, how did you know? How did you know when you had product market fit, up market? I'm interested in that. I'm also interested in your go-to-market, you know, philosophy and how that yeah. was different. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so the product market fit is really about the sophistication and the way in which the organization is set up. So we, we didn't just say, hey, let's go up market right. to any large organization and it'll be the exact same experience. You get, you get killed. It, yeah, it, it was what organizations up market are looking for a security operations partner. And those organizations are probably a pretty good fit. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are certain industries that I think tilted that direction sooner rather than later. You know, healthcare we've done really well with, manufacturing, financial institutions, uh, who have just made the determination that trying to be a security operations company or, or be a security company and kind of what is their core competency at the same time, maybe isn't the greatest idea. So, so it's more about, hey, where was the use case of a mid-market small enterprise company the same in a slightly larger organization? And that is where you know, we've had the most success. Um, and, then, and then over time, we've been able to to build out kind of those capabilities and make sure that uh, we're not only serving kind of the core of our, of our mid-market small enterprise, but also making sure that we meet the demands of those larger organizations. And you have different go-to-market teams for those se we do. segments? We, we do, we have different go-to-market teams and then we also uh, have a heavy channel focus within our go-to-market engine. So we have channel partners that service kind of different areas of the market, right? So like SM, uh, MSP we do a lot with on the lower end of the market and, and, and more and more in uh, slightly larger organizations kind of have like the core of the resale channel in the mid-market small enterprise. And then there's focus within the channel community uh, on larger accounts as well that typically be different names kind of within the channel ecosystem. So it's kind of a marriage of go-to-market teams and mentality with marketing, and then like how do we partner that with the various channel ecosystems that make sense in the segments we want to sell into. As an executive, how do you think about the balance, executive and, and operations, how do you think about the balance between getting new logos, and then retention. Retention obviously is everything. And yeah. It's a silent killer of SaaS companies and obviously managed service companies is, is churn. So how do you think about that balance in, in, in terms of what your experience has been, maybe how you compensate you know, go-to-market yeah. pros, yeah. et cetera? Yeah, so we compensate all of our go-to-market teams on, um, on churn or retention of the customer, yeah. whether they're focused on acquisition or they're focused on customer success, right? Upsell and cross-sell. Everyone carries some component of churn. At the end of the day, if your customers aren't happy, you, you got a problem that you have to solve. Mm -hmm. And that translates itself into how successful you are on new customer acquisition. Now we've been fortunate, we've been a very strong new customer acquisition engine uh, for the entire tenure that I've been at the company uh, and our retention has been really strong as well, and now we're working to build out additional you know, uh, capabilities and modules, if you will, to cross-sell and upsell uh, as our customers are looking for more specific capabilities on top of the platform that we've built. And that obviously you know, helps with growth, but it also helps with the efficiency of that growth, and at the end of the day, the efficiency and operating leverage of the bottom line. So your business model is, I mean, financially, I love it, you got an annual recurring revenue. Yep. You've got an NRR model that as you add modules and capabilities, you're getting higher ACVs. Yep. So I presume those are important metrics and obviously retention is another one. What can you tell me about how, how that's going? How's, yeah. How do the numbers look to you without you know, divulging any proprietary information? On yeah, this? it's all trending. So we're still a high growth, hyper growth company. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've done a really good job of doing that, both with a mix of new customers and uh, a focus on the customer itself, so cross sell, upsell. As we've been able to you know, increase that mix, you know, naturally when you get to a certain size and scale, you're going to have a mix shift from new customer to cross sell, upsell. There's just no way around it because the base continues to mature and grow over time. 
uh, and the cost to acquire a new customer is significantly higher than the cost to you know, add an incre you know, incremental dollar to an existing customer. Right. So when that, as that mix changes, your sales efficiency changes dramatically and therefore your profitability profile changes dramatically and kind of away you go. It's a beauty of a, of a SaaS model. And you're seeing larger and larger deals. Uh, some larger some deals. number of customers are over whatever X is. And it, yeah, larger deals, dollars. land and expand motions. You, know, you can do stuff at high volume um, with your customer base and cross sell and upsell uh, in, in areas of the business that they want you to participate in. You kind of describe you know, the value prop and how, why you win, customers coming back saying, hey, you're more focused, you're experts at this, let us focus on our business. When you lose, or when you don't get the deal, why is that? Is that just a matter of showing up, being there, giving an opportunity? Is it competition from in-house or other tools vendors? Help yeah. us understand that. Yeah, I think this goes back to an earlier question, in particular with like uh, upmarket customers. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, if we don't get the product market fit right, um, i.e. we find a customer that maybe is still holding on to like doing it themselves more materially, they want a little bit more access to you know, the, the back end, if you will, uh, than typically our, our normal customer would want. So we've built what we call a data explorer uh, product and we have a second version of that coming out which kind of answers that need, but that's historically where we've seen kind of the most tension up market. Uh, in the core of, of, of our markets, uh, I would say it's kind of the normal competitive dynamic. We have very uh, strong win rates, we have good conversion rates kind of across the board, uh, kind of depends on the background of the individual organization, what they you know, most materially value with regards to attack surface, so th there's nothing that like stands out there for us. As you know, larger customers sometimes want specials. Yeah. Right? So you, you go into an account, it's a blue chip account, love to put it on your website, and they say, we want you to do X. Yeah. Do you say, hey, this is our platform, we're good at this, you know, if you're going to trust us and we'll, we'll deliver to an outcome, or will you sometimes say, all right, we'll do this special? Yeah, so the only things that we do typically that are special would be like integrations. So if yeah. there's specific uh, tools that are uh, you know, particularly important in particular to like a, a vertical or a segment of the market. Uh, so we just released like an iManage integration which is critical to the legal vertical. Sure. Um, so that would be an example of something that we would do special, but we don't do it necessarily for one individual customer. It's more like, hey, we've seen a trend with legal organizations that are really looking for an iManage integration or Epic in healthcare, for example. Uh, and that would be like where we, where we play with you know, our specialization, our customization. Uh, but really when we're, when we're looking for those customers, it's all about uh, are you looking for the outcome? Yeah. Right, so are you looking to ensure that you have protection, that you have a strong security posture, that you can present that posture back out to you know, the business you know, entities, your insurer, your regulators, your customers to prove that you're a reliable source from a supply chain perspective. And if you kind of fit that profile uh, and you're looking for a vendor to kind of be the cornerstone of your security operation, we do very, very well there. If uh, you're trying to build out your SOC yourself, we can augment that SOC. Uh, if you're trying to still operate within Articles platform as a SIM, you're probably still a little bit more legacy than, than most of our customers would be in, in terms of the way of thinking there, which is fine. Um, but I, I see the market shifting a little bit more in the direction of the platform than, than the way it has you know, historically been. In, with. in that survey I was showing you with ETR, uh, about half of the 321 respondents were attending RSA and we asked them, what do you want to see at RSA? Yeah. Big shock, they wanted to understand you know, AI security. Now, okay, AI is a hot topic, but I, I also, we didn't do the follow-up, but I've talked to a number of people here, they're concerned about securing their AI. Yeah. AI is like a different animal. So, we're 20 minutes in, we haven't talked about AI, so congratulations. It's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> um, but what about that? Uh, two questions, I guess. Your AI play in terms of just being more efficient, you know, running your network better, et cetera, but there's also AI or security for AI. What, yeah. what do you, how, what do you, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, so the first part, you know, we've leveraged AI machine learning, you know, in the core of our platform for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, we're making substantial investments to ensure that we can continue to leverage that in more meaningful ways. I think that presents itself twofold. One is just the efficiency of the SOC, so how you leverage detections, how you leverage the data, uh, what, the, what that data presents, how it presents itself. All that is about efficiency 
an operating leverage kind of within our model. Then there's kind of manners in which you engage with the customer, so language models and uh, chat bots and virtual concierge, things like that, where the customer can interact with the SOC itself or the data within the SOC itself in a more real-time manner with you know, a virtual uh, concierge team member. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have kind of AI as a new attack service. Right. Uh, and we're spending a lot of time to ensure that we can understand what's happening within a customer's, customer's environment as it relates to AI in the conte context of it being an attack surface, not just like a tool in the environment. Uh, and all of that is being built on top of our detection and response platform itself. So you have, you know, and you have endpoint and identity and network and cloud, uh, and now you have AI. Um, and, and that's going to be a, you know, the next big wave on, on kind of the detection and response side of things. Everybody, of course, wants to know when you're doing an IPO, I'm not going to ask you when, uh, but I will ask you, uh, how you're thinking about the window, um, how you're evaluating that. Is it, obviously the market conditions, if the market conditions were right, let's assume whatever that is, are you, would you be ready to do an IPO today? Yeah, yeah I think we're, so we're in a very good position as a, as a business, um, so there's no like necessity for mm -hmm. us to IPO. I think there's uh, opportunities from a brand perspective or a public currency perspective that make sense for us as a business. Um, but you know we're also weighing that against opportunistic you know M&A opportunities and other things, um, and I think when the timing is right, when the market is right, when there's been evidence of some players you know in the core of security that have done well in the public markets, uh, and kind of we're in the right window from a timing perspective, uh, we'll you know we'll be in the conversation. Uh, but until then, we're just going to keep. And it's not it's not like you have an aversion to being public. No, some companies CEOs that say I don't want to be a public company. I yeah. don't need to go public. I got plenty of capital. Yeah. Cash flow positive, whatever it is, I can I can stay private for yeah. a long time. Do you see benefits of being? You mentioned a few of them, but but it sounds like you're leaning toward yeah. We're very much open-minded to the, those benefits. Yeah. It sounds like something that you know ultimately is in the cards. Yeah, I think Arctic Wolf will at some point be a publicly traded company. Yeah. Uh, it's all about getting the timing right and making sure that it's you know a market that's open, receptive, and willing, and that we're at kind of the right stage in our you know, business and life cycle uh, to, to do it and do it right. Yeah, it's kind of like, I mean, the IPO market right now is still pretty chill. Yeah. You saw the Reddit, I'm sure you're following it much more closely than I am, but uh, Nick, awesome to see you. Thanks so much for coming. Great to you. see you. Good to see you face to face and uh, yeah. have a good rest of the show. Great. Oh. Quick plug, any news that you want to plug at the show? Yeah, I mean, we uh, we just did our uh, acquisition about six months ago. We have a bunch of news coming out on that shortly. We released um, uh, two new pieces of functionality. We did a bunch of integrations uh, this week, and then we have a cyber resiliency assessment product that we just released, which is about this connective tissue of kind of the customer's overall journey with the insurance ecosystem in particular, uh, and certain frameworks. So uh, something that's been asked for a lot from our customer base and kind of connects the customer into the outcomes associated with their cyber posture. Um, so we're, we're excited about both of those announcements and we have a few other ones to come. Fantastic, all right, thanks again, Nick, all appreciate right. it. Thank all you. right, keep it right there, we'll be back. Right after this short break, you're watching theCUBE, live from Moscone at RSA 2024. Right back.